Morning, everybody. We are just waiting a few more minutes until um, the room populates with people who signed up for the program. So we'll begin momentarily. Good morning and welcome. I am Emily Honig. I am co-chair with Linda, Linda Mazels of the Israel Committee. And on behalf of Linda and myself, we wanna welcome you to our program this morning, a conversation with Michael Eisenstadt from the Washington Institute, how the US, how the US um, can continue benefiting from its alliance with Israel. I want to thank um, Dr. Robert O. Friedman, a member of the Israel Committee, he's a board member, who is going to introduce Michael Eisenstadt, and he will moderate the Q&A after, um, after Michael speaks. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to enter it into either the Q&A or the chat, and we will try to get through as many questions as possible. So without further delay, I want to turn the program over to Bob um, and very much looking forward to what will be a very, very timely and interesting conversation with Michael Eisenstadt. Thank you very much, Emily. We meet at a very challenging time for U.S.-Israeli relations. The U.S. is putting increasing pressure on Israel to stand with the U.S. in condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine instead of playing a neutral role in the conflict as it has been doing. Several weeks ago, Under Secretary of State Victoria Nealand bluntly told the Israelis they shouldn't become the left haven for the dirty money that's fueling Putin's and that Israel should join the financial sanctions that the US and EU has placed on Russia. Another incident in the US-Israeli relationship is Iran, 
the U.S. has been trying to reach a new nuclear agreement with Iran, so far without success. However, if the agreement does go through, Iran will receive billions of dollars as U.S. sanctions are lifted, which could be used to build more missiles to threaten Israel, as well as provide more funding for Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and Hamas, sworn enemies of Israel. There are only a few of the, of the problems currently challenging the U.S.-Israeli relationship, and it is not clear how they'll be resolved. Fortunately, today we have an expert on U.S.-Israeli relations, Michael Eisenstadt, who will help us to understand the nuances of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. I've known Michael for many years, I've been enjoyed and proof from his publications. Let me now tell you a little bit about Michael. He is the fellow and director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policies Military and Security Studies Program. Prior to joining the Institute in 1989, Mr. Eisenstadt worked as a military analyst with the US government. He served for 26 years as an officer in the US Army Reserve, and it's 21 years longer than I did in the, in the Army Reserve, by the way. Uh, for retiring in 2010. His military service included active duty stints in Iraq with the United States Forces Iraq Headquarters in 2010 and the Human Terrain System Assessment Team 2008. He has numerous publications of which I'll mention only a few. They are Operating in the Gray Zone, Countering Iran's Asymmetric Way of War, U.S. Military Engagement in the Broader Middle East between nine and all U.S. military options in Syria. Beyond worst case analysis, Israel's likely response to an Israeli preventive strike. Beyond forever wars and great power competition, rethinking the U.S. military role in the Middle East, an expanded agenda for U.S.-Israeli partnership, new technologies, new opportunities. And one I must say I found particularly useful for my own research on U.S.-Israeli relations Asset Test 2021, how the U.S. can keep benefiting from the alliance with Israel. Folks, I think you're in for a real treat. This week. Michael, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Bob, and thanks for the kind uh, introduction. Um, I just want to say before I start that uh, my presentation today is based on two publications that I co-authored with another Washington Institute fellow, uh, David Pollack. Um, the most recent, the more recent one is um, Asset Test 2021, How the U.S. Can Keep Benefiting from Its Relationship with Israel or its Alliance with Israel. This is available on the Washington Institute uh, website. The best things in life are free, and this is free. It's a, available as a PDF. It's an update of an earlier study that David and I did um, in 2012 um, called Asset Test, How the U.S. Uh, Benefits from Its Alliance with Israel. Um, which is also available on our website um, for free. So if you find uh, my presentation here um, interesting today and you'd like to read more, um, there's more where this came from on, our, on the Washington Institute website. So let me just um, start, and if I could, uh, if we could bring up the um, PowerPoint slides. As a military analyst, kind of every, everything has to be in PowerPoint, but it's, I think these are relatively um, um, clean slides. So. Um, let me just start a little bit about uh, the you know, background. I think most of you probably know about, and if you could get to the next uh, page, please. Um, the, um, the US-Israel relationship goes back to the very founding of the state. The United States was the first country to um, recognize Israel. I think 11 minutes after um, Israeli independence was declared. Um, but really the US-Israel special relationship didn't really bud to the late 1960s. Israel has always, as part of its national security concept, tried to have a great power patron. For the first two decades or so, that was France. Um, and, you know, and they, they made common cause kind of in, in, in you know, both, both seeing themselves as um, um, you know, um, beleaguered by uh, radical Arab nationalism. Um, France helped Israel's uh, nuclear pro program get off the ground. Um, a lot of Israel's weapons in the 1950s and 60s were, were French made. But after the 67 war, um, France changed its policy. Um, and basically, um, Israel was without a great power patron and the US stepped in to fill the gap. Um, and that was the real, the real first step was the sale of F-4 Phantom and A-4 Skyhawk aircraft. I think it was 1968 and, um, or so when those sales uh, first went through or were approved. 
And that began the um, um, you know, strategic cooperation between the United States and Israel in the military domain. In the intelligence areas, it goes back to the 1950s. The Mossad um, and Israeli uh, military intelligence had close ties to the American intelligence community going back to the 50s. So this kind of, the US-Israel relationship kind of slowly percolated, um, but really took off in the late 60s. And it's been really going only upward um, ever since then. Though, I, of course, it has to be said, there's been ups and downs and periods of tension, simply because the, the interests of the two countries haven't always been perfectly aligned. And as a result, each country seeking its own interests um, have sometimes um, resulted in, in tensions between the two. Let me just then, you know, with that little bit of introduction, let me just go to where we are now. Um, and during the Q&A, if you want to discuss a little bit more of the history, we can do so. But the main thing that I think that sustains US-Israel relationship here is shared values. Israel in the region is really the one society that's seen to be like us. It's a democracy, it's a, it's a very rambunctious democracy. Um, and, and the values of, of most of the people there are aligned with the values of most Americans, or at least that's the way I think it's, it's perceived. Um, and also, like I said, shared strategic interest. That goes back to the Cold War when the United States and Israel were on the so same side of this struggle. The Soviet Union supported a lot of Israel's enemies, Egypt under Nasser, um, Syria, Iraq. So um, that's the basis. However, we no longer have the Cold War that ended in around 1990. We had a period of, you know, kind of the unipolar moment when the US was the predominant great power, but now we're entering a period of great power competition. And in this period, not just political and military, but increasingly economic and technological factors are gonna be important, especially with regard to China, where it's as much an economic competition as, as well as a um, strategic and military competition. And here, I, uh, we argue in our, in our monograph that Israel is very well placed to deliver outside contributions, okay? And this is something I'll discuss a little bit more further into the, into the talk about how the Israeli R&D um, and innovation makes a, a disproportionate contribution to certain niche sectors of the US, US economy. And I wanna emphasize the fact, the, the term niche. Um, it's not across the board, but it's in some very important areas of the economy that are very important to the future of America's economic competitiveness. It's the same thing also in the military realm. Um, Israel does not provide across the board, you know, value added. It's very often in very important niche areas. And I'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment. Um, I would also, we also argue in the paper that Israel is the ally in the region whose interests most closely align with that of the US. Again, not perfectly, but, but overall in many areas. And we have here on this slide here in the, in the middle here, you have a series of bullets, which describes the areas of overlap. I wanna emphasize here one of the middle bullets that as the US reduces its military and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance presence in the Middle East, as it focuses more now on Russia because of the invasion of Ukraine, but increasingly China, um, Israel and its cooperation with other Arab states will be increasingly important to kind of fill this gap. Um, and it may not be possible for Israel and, and its partners to fill this gap fully. So this is an issue perhaps we could talk about a little bit uh, further on. Also to the degree that we're facing issues related to sustainability, climate change, resilience and the like, Israel, because of its um, you know, startup um, ecosystem, which has a disproportionate number of startups in the area related to clean tech, high tech agriculture and the like, Israel can make an oversized contribution to dealing with the sustainability and, and climate challenges of the future. And I would just quote here, this, this, old, this old quote 2006, going back to 2006 by Bill Gates saying, the innovation going on in Israel is critical to the future of the technology business. He was talking, I think, about the IT sector at that time, but I think this is true about a lot of different sectors today, um, that innovation going on in Israel really uh, makes a overwhelmingly disproportionate contribution in this area. And we've seen that during the COVID pandemic where um, developments in Israel related to epidemiology and, 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 and testing the effectiveness of um, um, the, the vaccine, um, the Pfizer vaccine in particular, um, played an important role in, public, in the decisions of public health officials in the United States. So bottom line, I just want to make the point is that clearly it's an asymmetric relationship between the United States and Israel. The United States has given over $150 billion 
um, in grants to Israel since 1949. Um, and there's no doubt the United States is, a, is really the great power in the world today. Israel is a regional power. So it's, it's an asymmetric relationship, but Israel has provided critical political, economic, um, and military uh, kind of um, um, payback, um, which is very, has been very important to America's military as well as to its uh, economy. And so this is a, it's a two-way relationship, even if it's asymmetrical, that, developed, that delivers uh, tangible benefits to the US. Next page, please. So here, I just wanna kind of go into a little bit more detail in the areas related to what we call um, hard and soft security. Hard security meaning kind of military related stuff, um, strategic you know, intelligence, counterterrorism, um, you know, you know, military affairs, and soft security, which has to do with um, economic competitiveness, um, uh, sustainability, water and food security, renewable energy sources and like. And, and these are here, again, you look in the soft security challenges, the areas that the, um, the Israelis deliver, these are among the most important areas, um, you know, in terms of America's ability to deal with the soft security challenges of the future. And I'll go into a little bit more of this uh, again in a moment, um, but clearly, you know, we, you know, during this last 20, 30 years, the soft security um, deliverables uh, or contributions that Israel makes have been increasingly important. But as a result of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, um, we are seeing again, we have a return to history, if you will, where um, great power, uh, competition, military strength is becoming once again, important in international affairs. And this is also gonna be important with, with China. And here Israel also has important um, contribution to make in the area of intelligence sharing. And we go into the history of um, you know, contributions Israel has made in this area, counterterrorism cooperation, Israel's critical role um, you know, in developing approaches to counterterrorism. For instance, Israel was the first country to do an aircraft takedown in 1972 with the Sabina aircraft um, hijacking to Lod Airport in Israel. And, that, and then the Entebbe um, rescue um, in Uganda, which um, caused the United States to self, set up to inspire people in the US military to set up Delta Force um, based on kind of the Israeli inspiration and the, and the British SAS model. The Germans set up their GSG-9 counterterrorism unit um, after watching what the Israelis did. Drone, rocket, and missile defense. This is an area which is gonna be increasingly important um, as many of Israel's enemies, as well as America's enemies and adversaries rely heavily on rockets, missiles, and drones as part of their um, kind of um, military toolkit. Military lessons learned, this goes back to 67, um, the 67 war and, and some of the um, uh, Israel providing the United States with captured equipment, captured Soviet equi equipment with the United States was then able to analyze um, and to divide, you know, to understand how they work in order to devise countermeasures or tactics for dealing with Soviet aircraft and Soviet radar systems and the like. Defense industrial cooperation, this spans the areas from artificial intelligence, robotics, intelligence, um, surveillance, and uh, reconnaissance, um, such as drones and the like. And then Homeland Security, especially after 9-11, this was increasingly important. And Israel provided a lot of um, um, kind of input in this area. There is um, a lot of uh, cooperation between police departments. And I know this has been a kind of a, a big source of criticism by the BDS community, um, saying, you know, making all kinds of claims that tactics used by American police um, um, you know, uh, leg, neon and neck and the like um, came from Israel. To my knowledge, there is absolutely no evidence that that's the case. And most of the policing uh, uh, discussions have to do with counterterrorism and not just kind of routine policing. But in fact, there was even an article that came across which the Israelis um, kind of um, have, you know, early on because they had to deal with suicide terrorists who are wearing suicide belts. They had, you know, very often police Anybody who's been through, you know, like I, I know from my own military training, the training focuses on you focus, you you aim for center of mass of the target. That is kind of the upper torso because it's the largest area on the target, most likely a chance of hitting. If you're dealing with an adversary though that has suicide belts on, a bullet to a suicide belt could set it off and cause an inadvertent detonation, causing people to be killed when um, there are other alternatives. So actually, the Israelis developed 
um, less lethal or, or, or you know, shooting techniques that do not focus on center of mass, that focused on disabling, such as leg shots or head shots. Now, of course, the head shot's not disabling, but leg shots, you know, which also has their dangers, but it's better than hitting the torso where the belt could, you know, the belt could explode. So actually, I, I read an article where a policeman said, as a result of my training in Israel, I came to kind of question our approach of, of shooting of center at center of mass, where there's a greater chance of killing people. And then maybe, you know, we, we looked at you know procedures for shooting kind of you know upper legs and the like, which again is very dangerous because of the femoral artery and the like, but it's it's less likely to be lethal um, in many cases. There's also there's also a, a lot of you know it, it's also harder to do, but the point is there's, there's been a lot of propaganda on this and and I, I don't think, to my understanding I, I've I've talked to some people about this there's there's no basis to a lot of the claims that are made about police cooperation but anyhow the bottom line is in both the hard and security um, realms Israel has made really oversized contributions to America's ability to deal with the challenges that it faces and there's really I can't I really I don't think there's really many other countries or any other countries that have made such important and diverse contributions to American security uh, as Israel has in many of these areas. And again, they, the study that Dave and I wrote give you know, many you know, tangible examples of this. And I'll give us some more examples as, as you know, we kind of go on in a minute. Next slide, please. Okay, here's just a little bit more some kind of factoids here, which kind of give you, I think, a, a greater appreciation of how um, Israel contributes to the um, um, American economy in, in particular in this case. First of all, if you look at just as a destination for exports, Israel is only about two and a half percent of the Middle East population, but it's the destination of over 20% of US exports to the region. According to the um, US Census Bureau, which um, is, is where you get these figures from, interestingly, um, it's about 22 or 23% in 2021 of US exports um, toward, towards the Middle East, and I'm not including North Africa for this statistic, go to Israel. And only, only the UAE in the Middle East imported more um, as a percentage than Israel. Israel's ahead of Saudi Arabia and all the other countries in the region. I have here also a factoid about Turkey. Turkey is not counted as part of the Middle East um, you know, for our statistics here, but Turkey has nine times the population of Israel, but Israel still imports more goods from the US than Turkey does. So again, as you know, kind of an importer of American products, Israel punches against its weight. Now, what about its contribution to the American economy? Okay, so I have a bunch of statistics here. Israel is number one in the world in terms of numbers of engineers and scientists per capita. Number one, and, and these figures are actually from 2020. The 2021 figures are not available for all of these. So I'm just going with the 2020 figures. There might be slight variation when the new figures come in. Sometimes Israel goes up or down one or two points a year or something like that. But so in terms of R&D investment as a percentage of G GDP, Israel is number one, it, at least it was in 2020. I think in 2022, it may have been supplanted by South Korea, but if so, it's number two. So very high in, the, you know, in terms of world standing. Number one, in terms of numbers of AI, artificial intelligence firms per capita, and number three, in the world, number three in the world in the total number of AI startups. And I have a graphic to show this in a moment, which is, this is a very striking figure. And, and just to give you the importance of this factor, you know, Russian President Putin, you know, is famous for saying, whoever controls AI will control the world. I think that kind of, you know, you could get the understanding, the understanding of how we've used the world um, by that quote. But the point is, AI will be very, very important for economy. Um, in the future, um, in, in all the, in fact, AI will affect all domains of human life, okay? You know, whether it has to do with um, economic activities, um, e-commerce, um, you know, heat, how you heat your house, um, how your car functions, how we shop and how we actually do our work. Um, AI will influence every aspect of human activity. And Israel is, is a real leader in this. In terms of unicorn, unicorns, unicorns are privately owned firms that have a valuation of a billion dollars or more. Israel is number one in the world in unicorns per capita. I can't remember, it's, it's in the, I think it's 36 or something like that. I'm, the number might be wrong because I might be uh, 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 remembering it incorrectly, but this is really astounding for such a small country to have that achievement. 
So it used to be said about Israel, Israel is a startup nation, but they don't really do well at scaling up. That very often what happens, a lot of the startups get bought out by foreign companies, and I'll touch on that in a minute, and they become R&D centers for foreign companies, and they never really scale up on their own. They become kind of an R&D center for somebody else's company. But we're seeing now with these unicorns, a billion dollar valuation means it's, it's becoming a big company. So Israel is actually scaling up. So the, 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 the startup nation curse is, is, it looks like it's being kind of supplanted, or at least we're seeing a trend which might indicate that Israelis are becoming better at, at scaling up their startups and, and becoming big ongoing um, you know, uh, firms. Now, with regard to wastewater recycling, number one in the world, again, close, close to 90% of wastewater gets recycled. Things around 80, 87, 88%. Number five in the world in patents per capita. Number seven, according to Bloomberg, in innovation, although there's different innovation, um, uh, 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 different companies have different innovation kind of rankings. So I think Bloomberg is the highest one, number seven. Others say number 10, number 15, but the bottom line is it's still, and there's different ways you kind of assess innovation with your different types of innovation. But bottom line is Israel is, in, is kind of top rated in terms of innovation. And then they had 10 firms in the Forbes top 50 ag tech food tech ratings a few years ago. I think that was again, 2020. So for a country that is, you know, of, of 9 million or so, that, you know, tiny percentage of all of humanity to have 10 firms in the top 10, 50 firms that are contributing to agricultural, high tech agriculture or, or food technology ratings, it's amazing. <clears throat> so let me, the second point here about Israel R&D centers making critical niche contributions to the competitiveness of the US economy or US parent companies. I mentioned before, a lot of Israeli startups become, get bought out by foreign companies, by American companies in this case. I think Americans tend to, I think of the 300 foreign companies that have set up R&D centers in Israel using Israeli startups as the kind of the, the basis, 200 of them are Americans, which is another, kind of one of the um, benefits of the longstanding alliance between the United States and Israel, that the United States is the country, a first resort for Israeli companies that wanna scale up and, and, and reach a global market. Because US and Israel has such close relations, there's such close relations between American and Israeli academia and, 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 and industry. Again, America is the company of first resort in many cases. So American companies tend to, tend to benefit from the Israeli innovation um, ecosystem. Um, and I mentioned here, we, you know, Dave and I kind of have, you know, Abbott Labs, Apple, Cisco, GE, GM, Google, IBM, Microsoft, all the big American companies, the most dynamic American companies have R&D centers in Israel. And some of these R&D centers make very, very important contributions. In fact, going beyond R&D centers, Intel has several integrated circuit manufacturing uh, facilities in Israel. That and, and this is the, the last time we had a kind of a, a dramatic you know, comment, public comment like this, that, you know, in, in 2011, 40% of global sales of laptop microprocessors were, were thanks to mic microprocessors developed and produced in Israel. Um, and, and since then, my, um, Intel has only um, expanded its operations in Israel since then. They have several factories and they just recently, I think, bought or, or decided to build another one. So, you know, in the IT arena, especially Israel has made really oversized contributions to its American partners. So, um, and it results in tech transfers to American companies and the creation, um, if not the preservation, then the creation, in many cases of tens of thousands of American jobs. We tried to figure out for our paper, how many American jobs might be, you know, um, um, you know attributable to American, Israeli innovation and, and the like. I think it's an impossible task. I think there's no really no, no way to know, except to say that at the very least, it's probably tens of thousands. Um, um, because a lot of Israeli firms set up American subsidiaries in order to be able to produce for the American global market, you get tech transfer as a result of that and they get American employees. Some Israeli management maybe, but very often the management you know, is, is mostly American and all the workers are American. So you see this you know, in, Netafim, which is a very good example, and I'll talk a little bit about this company a little bit later. Netafim was a pioneer in drip irrigation, started in the mid 60s. And now you have Netafim America, which is I think a wholly owned um, subsidiary here, um, based in California. And they produce for the world market, all American employees. So, but using Israeli um, 
Israeli uh, um, technology. Likewise, Elta um, uh, and other Israeli companies have subsidiaries in the United States, which have factories here with American um, employees using an Israeli technology and innovation, though to produce, uh, which, are, which is produced here for the American global market. Next page, please. Okay, here, this is just a wonderful graphic here. This is from a European-based consulting firm, which basically showed, um, you know, basically um, the number of AI startups in countries around the world. So of course, the United States leads the world here with nearly 1400 AI startups. Europe, in, um, all of Europe has about 769 when this was written startups, okay? Israel has 362. So Israel has half as much of all of Europe, number of AI startups. Again, that's an, an amazing accomplishment, um, only, only surpassed by China um, and the United States, if you're talking about individual country, countries. Israel has more AI startups than the UK, which is Israel has 362, U UK has 245, as you see here. So it's, again, this is a very dramatic kind of graphic, which really kind of tells a very interesting story. Next page, please. So anyhow, I'm just gonna wind down my, my presentation here with a, a few points. You know, while I've, you know, painted, you know, well, let me just say, I'm old enough to remember when the Israeli economy was based on Jaffa oranges and diamonds. That was like in the 60s and 70s. And, um, and, and, and through the 80s. 80s, you got more defense, you know, manufacturing and the like. Then it really took off in the 90s. So one of the points I think that's important to make is that you can't take, this wasn't always the way it was, and it therefore might not always be the way it will be. And the factors that have gone into creating this innovation um, kind of uh, ecosphere have to be tended to and watched over. And there's a number of warning signs, okay? So let me just say, okay, first of, co of course, I think it's very important that the, the relationship between the United States and Israel was, you know, was played a very important role here. Although I think it was mainly an indigenous process, but um, again, US financial aid and grant aid was very important. You know, um, enabling the Israeli economy to deal with their large defense burden and have money, you know, um, available also to um, create this kind of innovation ecosphere. Um, and and now you have, you know, you know, there's always been tensions between the United States and Israel. It's it's just, you know, um, going back to the time of um, Nixon and Kissinger in the '73 war, where the U.S. had a reassessment after the war and it held up arms transfers um, to Israel. Um, after the Israeli strike on the Osirak reactor, you had the delay in arms transfers for the, you know, so the United States, and this was in 1981 under Reagan, who was a very pro-Israel you know, president. But after the, uh, the attack on Osirak, um, the Iraqi nuclear reactor, the United States held up arms transfers to, to signal its displeasure. Um, so, so there's always going to be tensions like this. Uh, a decade later, the U.S. Secretary of uh, Defense wrote a thank you note to the Israelis for destroying, destroying Osirak. So what a difference a decade makes sometimes in these kind of things. But there's always going to be built in tensions between the United States and Israel. Also stuff related to you know, Israeli policy towards the Palestinians. Now, um, you know, Bob talked about uh, American displeasure over Israeli policy towards Ukraine. Although to be honest with you in this one, I, I'm, I'm kind of sympathetic on you know, with the dilemmas they face in this regard. And in the end, I think they've come out with a reasonable policy approach. Um, and then over Iran, because we know the Israelis are very unhappy with the nuclear deal that's being uh, negotiated now with the um, Iranians. So that's gonna be, um, uh, you know, uh, that's gonna remain. We're also seeing in the American society, especially in, in the left wing of the Democratic Party, growing anti-Israel se sentiment. And that's something to look out for, growing support for BDS in certain sectors of the uh, American society. So that's a, a challenge um, um, that um, Israel and its supporters will have to face in the, in the future. So, uh, diminished self-reliance and security affairs. Um, the challenge from Iran is not a challenge that Israel can do on its own, deal with on its own. It needs American backing and the United States is less enthusiastic about this. Um, you know, the United States is kind of, you know, you know, you hear the constant refrain, no more, no more forever wars. The United States is kind of worry weary as a result of its two decade involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. It doesn't, it, it needs to focus on the China threat and Russia and therefore cannot pay as much attention to the Middle East as it, as it used to. So this will be a continued source of tension in the US-Israel relationship. 
You have also governance failures in Israel. You know, we've had, you had four elections in two years until recently, and now the current Israeli government just lost its majority, although we'll see how it will play out um, going forward. So, and this has all kinds of real impacts on the, the budget, their ability to pass a budget. The, the defense budget in the area that I focus on has been relying on kind of like supplementals for several years. And you cannot do long-term planning when you rely on some supplementals. You need a five years, 10 year budget, um, or, or kind of, you need to have consistency in the passing of the budget in order to um, do what you need to do in order to plan for military um, contingencies in the future. And the Israelis have been hindered by this as a result of their governmental dysfunction. Um, so that's another challenge that they face. Socioeconomic and educational challenges. Israel has a lot of the same problems that the United States has in terms of uh, polarization of uh, wealth in the society. You have large number of very wealthy or small number of very wealthy people and a large number of people, you know, kind of, um, or a growing number of people who are not doing very well. And the middle class, you know, is kind of, you're seeing greater, you know, um, kind of, uh, spread between you know, haves and have nots in your society. Also problems with the Israeli education system, um, which um, a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of criticism saying that it underperforms, not just at the, um, you know, mainly at the elementary level, you know, but there are also some criticisms at the university level as well. Um, also a lot of Israeli academics end up coming here um, because of either greater opportunities or, or, or lack of suitable opportunities in Israel. So you have a brain drain, um, although, there's actually an argument to be made. I, I once read a paper very interesting saying the brain drain actually creates linkages, which in the long run might help Israel. So there's kind of, it's a mixed blessing in that regard. I mentioned BDS, delegitimation, uh, you know, efforts, and then the whole issue of uh, peace with the Palestinians of which I'm kind of a skeptic, uh, you know, in an ideal world, I think it would be great if there could be kind of this two state solution. I just don't see it happening. Um, and as a result, we have to find a way to make this current situation as tolerable as possible for both sides, um, given I don't see that there's any potential for a solution at this time. And then we have a whole bunch of uh, policy recommendations in terms of you know, the Abraham Accords, um, um, the, you know, the normalization agreements with the UAE and Bahrain um, has created all kinds of potential for cooperation with these countries um, you know, with regard to sustainability issues and um, um, investment. You know, there was a UAE investment in Jordan and Israel to create a um, trilateral uh, kind of uh, um, solar power um, kind of sharing grid. Um, and that's, that's hopefully the kind of things that will come out of this agreement. Hopefully we'll be seeing more things like this in terms of cooperation with regard to water and, and, and sustainable energy and, and high-tech agriculture and the like. So anyhow, there's a lot of, you know, although there's a lot of clouds on the horizon, there's also a lot of things to, you know, that provide hope um, and, and, and hopefully in the long run, this opening to the Arab world, at least parts of the Arab world, might loop back and, and maybe in some ways help create um, a more normal relationship between Israel and the Palestinians. Anyhow, let me just, in closing, if you could get to the next slide, I have a bunch of pictures of some of, some of the Israeli high-tech you know, kind of achievements. Actually, Netafim, the, the drip irrigation system is very low-tech. It's just, it's just hoses with water that kind of, kind of meter, meter out droplets of water in, in, into the ground. Um, there might be some high tech aspects of the design of the, of the holes to ensure that the water you know, comes out um, in, in a very um, kind of, um, you know, kind of um, uh, metered way, if you will. But it, it's really, it's just, it's just kind of uh, plastic or plastic tubes. Um, you know, so there's nothing, nothing really high tech about it, but it was kind of an ingenious invention that really transformed um, agriculture and it's been transforming agriculture around the world. Next page, please. Here's a more recent uh, um, in, in invention, um, the water gen, which is basically, you know, it takes the moisture in the air and turns it into, uh, you know, uh, potable water for people to drink. And um, the Israelis have exported this to the Gulf. There's, there's units in Gaza um, even, and, there's, um, and, and they're exporting this um, elsewhere. So this is just, again, a, a, just a wonderful example of how, you know, now this is more high tech, of, of taking, getting the moisture out of the air and turning it into drinkable water. Um, but this is just a few years old. This is a, new, a newer um, invention, which is, you know, again, has been supported already in several places around the world. Next page, please. The back of the solar windows. These are windows, you can see on the left here, you see there's lines going through the windows. These are, you have kind of horizontal uh, photo, photovoltaic cells 
horizontally placed inside a dual pane window that enables both the light to go through. So you, you have unimpeded vision of, uh, of what's going on outside, but it also then uses the, the wall of the building, which you know, ha, you know, takes up a large area. And here we have a picture of the former Sears, I think it's called the Willis Tower now, which um, I don't know if it's complete, if the installation of the solar windows have been completed there, but um, there, there was a contract signed a few years ago to install the Pythagoras solar windows in, in the Sears Tower. Um, so again, I don't know how uh, much traction this invention has gained, but I, I just thought it, it, it sounded, I, you know, I, I think it had a high cool factor you know, for me. So I think this is a good example of, again, things that the um, Israeli startups are doing in, in, in the high-tech um, arena um, that you know, are uh, contributing to sustainability uh, or, or our ability to uh, deal with uh, sustainability challenges of the future. Next one, please. This is the BYS Artificial Intelligence Autonomous Beehive. This is also very new. Basically, and again, I'm, I'm not a beekeeper, so I don't know a lot about beekeeping, but you know, supposedly you have, I think on the sides here, if you look on the right, the picture on the right, you have in these vertical, it looks like these kind of like shelves with files. You have the beehives in there and you have sensors which monitor each hive for activity um, and, 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 the, and the conditions inside the, the large hive. Um, and they're able to you know, kind of see which colonies are doing well, which are not doing so well, and alter, you know, kind of they, they ensure that they are fed properly if they need, if, you know, using artificial intelligence, they're able to monitor which highs are, are doing less well than others and then give them special attention. So this is, again, you know, we know that bee, uh, honeybees around the world have been suffering um, colony collapse for reasons that are not quite clear. And it's hoped that this approach, and you can see it's also solar powered, you see the solar panels on the roof, that this approach might help contribute to the, the rebuilding of um, bee, col bee, bee colonies around the world because bees play a very important role in agriculture in terms of cross-pollination of plants and the like. So again, helping uh, you know, repair the ecosystem. Next page, please. I'll get into military stuff and I have two, two pictures related to military stuff, right? And, I, and I'll just wrap up very quickly. Again, this is an example of a niche contribution by Israel. You know, Israel did make a, a fighter plane, you know, the, the La V that never went into production. It was canceled due to US pressure. The Israeli Air Force didn't want it either um, for reasons we could talk about more, but, but Israel has been very good at, at niche contribution. So they had this helmet mounted queuing system, which is basically enables the pilot, you know, fighter aircraft have what they call heads up displays, which is kind of like the dashboard or kind of like a, it's a, it's a clear piece of glass, which, which they have projected on it you know, the, um, you know, all kinds of, you know, information that are important for the pilot in engaging enemy aircraft. With the helmet mounted queuing system, it's actually projected on the inside of the helmet so that if the pilot is looking to the side, um, because he has a threat coming from, you know, um, you know, uh, um, come from his left, he still is able to see the information that would be uh, projected on a heads up display on the inside of his visor. Plus, if he fires an air to air missile, and he's looking at the target, the missile will know the direction of the target and the missile will then turn automatically. So it'll follow where his eye is, is looking and, 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 and um, go there. Israel is not the only country that makes this, I should say, actually the South Africans were the first ones to do it in the, I think in the seventies, but the Israeli, you know, the Israeli units that they make are, are considered to be among the best. And we, you know, almost the entire US um, Air Force, Navy and Marine Corps use the, um, Elbit Collins. Collins is an American company, Elbit an Israeli company. They use the Israeli made helmet uh, today. And, and, and many of our allies do use it too, including Arab countries, by the way. Next, next, and this is the last one. The next slide um, is about Iron Dome. And of course, Iron Dome, Iron Dome is kind of emblematic of a lot of things related to Israeli success. Um, in the past, it was a question whether a bullet could hit a bullet. That's kind of like the, um, you know, the way people talk about um, uh, uh, you know, intercepting um, a rocket or a missile, you have to hit it, or if you don't hit it, you have a proximity warhead that explodes close to the incoming uh, missile and, 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 and causes damage and causes the missile to break up. The Israelis were the first one to develop their, um, a fielded, um, proven missile defense system, which is the Iron Dome, okay? And it's 90% um, effective. I think it's close to 3,000, 2,500, um, successful intercepts, I think before last May, before the, um, 
the uh, conflict in Gaza last May. I don't know what the number is right now, but again, 90% success rate. So they've proven you can hit a bullet with a bullet. They've sold to, to the United States, but because of issues related to um, cybersecurity and other factors, it's not clear whether this will be integrated into the American um, you know, um, force structure. Um, so there's some issues related to that. Also, there's been issues related to foreign sales. We know that the Ukrainians asked for this um, at the beginning of their war with uh, Russia. I, I don't think it was really, first of all, Israel doesn't have enough of its own. Israel is building up, I think they have about 10 batteries and they want at least 13, if not 15. So they don't have enough for themselves. They just expended many hundreds, if not more, interceptors last May in Gaza, in the war in Gaza. So they're short of stocks. And the US just passed a supplemental, a billion dollar supplemental in Congress a couple of months ago to replenish Israel's supplies. So they were in no position to give it to the Ukrainians, first of all. Second of all, it's really not what the Ukrainians needed because Iron Dome works because Israel is a very small country and has a very, you know, there's a very small kind of footprint you have to protect. Ukraine is a very large country and you just, the Israelis don't have the, the numbers or, you know, to provide it in the density that would be required to defend Ukraine. So it was, to me, it was a, it was kind of a, um, a red herring, but we could talk about that more during the Q&A. Anyhow, this really concludes my presentation. I look forward to the discussion with you and uh, your questions and or criticism, whatever. Thank you very much. A lot of good, you've, okay. you've covered a lot of good material. We really do appreciate it. I have four questions that have accumulated. Is so, Passover? <laughs> yeah, yeah, four yeah, questions. Yeah. Okay. Four questions. Just like Pesach. Okay. First of all, you mentioned in your talk um, about you thought that given the overall situation, uh, Israeli policy toward the Russian invasion of Ukraine is about as good as could be expected. I wonder if you could go into more detail on that, please. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say, look, Israel has the Russian bear breathing down its neck. Um, the Russians have a military presence in Syria. Israel operates in Syria um, several times a month, um, you know, at least once or twice weekly um, against Iranian efforts to entrench themselves there and to transform Syria into a springboard for military operations um, against Israel. And that occurs as a result of Israeli um, consultation with the Russians. And, and it's not coordination, but it's consultation. They do give the Russians um, last minute advance notice when they're operating near where the Russians are. And the Russians could really make Israel's life much more complicated in Syria should they desire to do so. And don't forget, Russia is still a great power, okay? And they're a nuclear power. And it's very important for Israel to um, avoid attentions if it's possible, if at all possible to Russia. So I understand from a real politique point of view, um, humanitarian concern. I think the Israelis, first of all, the Israelis did send the field hospital. That was the right thing to do. They sent humanitarian supplies. Maybe they should have done it quicker. Maybe they should have done it in larger numbers. Um, they are letting large numbers of Ukrainians um, in, not just those who are, you know, halakhic Jews, but those who are, you know, even, you know, have no kind of, you know, you know, no connection to Judaism, except maybe they have a, a family member through marriage or whatever in Israel. So I think Israel has done, um, given its situation quite a bit. And, you know, look, if you look at the, in the Europeans, you know, given the degree of foot, you know, dragging with the Germans, you know, providing helmets to the Ukrainians at first before, you know, they really got seized of the matter. I mean, Israel was not the only one who that um, acted in a kind of tentative manner at first. And I understand their considerations in this, but in the end, look, Yair Lapid recently, just a day or two, they criticized, you know, the Russians, um, you know, the foreign minister. So they come out in the end, you know, I think where they need to be, but I think they also have to be very careful, tread very carefully with the Russians as well. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Michael, if I could, sure. uh, we know in the US, there's a small group of progressive Democrats that you mentioned uh, who are basically anti-Israel. Mm -hmm. What do you, are you at all concerned that with Israel's neutral position in this war, there will be a spread of Israeli feeling given the U.S. position in the position as a result of not taking the American side 
more strongly, especially on sanctions and other things. Yeah, we even saw, like, for instance, Adam Kissinger had a quote saying that, you know, it's kind of, we expect our allies, and he kind of, you know, kind of called out Israel, you know, so to speak, you know, to, to line up with us. And, and look, I think this is a point where, you know, we have to, Americans are very, this is, this is an issue with American political culture. We're very absolutist. You're with us or against us, it's good or bad. And the fact of the matter is, we're able to, you know, take that position because we're an island nation, you know, kind of effectively. Um, you know, we're separated from, you know, a lot of the, the, the problems of, of Europe or, or the Middle East by, you know, two large oceans. And, um, you know, so yes, I, I, I think there will be people who this could affect, but the bottom line is, I think in the end, you know, I think Israel has to take those things into consideration, but in the end, they have much larger concerns that are kind of pressing and immediate. So I understand that. Look, I, I, there, are, there are things that I think that Israel does that are foolish. I think the handling of the JCPOA, which I think was very a very problematic agreement, um, you know, Netanyahu's speech on the Hill was, I think, very harmful and, and very, very short-sighted. Um, I, I, I actually share a lot of their criticisms of the JCPOA, but the way they handled their opposition to it was not constructive, and the way they've been handling it um, currently, I think, has not been very constructive. Um, that said, um, I think it was also, even though I thought the JCPOA was a big mistake, it was, I think, foolish of Trump to pull out of it, and it was foolish to, for Netanyahu to encourage him to pull out of it, but they didn't have a plan B. And uh, Trump was not willing to do what was necessary if the Iranians lashed out military as, as a result of applying maximum pressure. And so it was, it was, it was foolish to encourage him on, on, on that, um, you know, kind of. So I know, I know I'm, I'm getting a little bit um, kind of a, a far afield, but I'm just saying there are things that, you know, we're not always going to agree with Israel. And, and the, look, the growing progressive um, camp in the United States we don't know whether it's hit its high water mark and whether it will recede or whether it will continue to grow. And you know, the polling data among young people and their attitudes towards Israel, especially young Democrats, and even among some young Republicans, it's it's concerning. But you know, this just means you know, I, I think you know, Israel has to be more you know, um, I think uh, um, cognizant of this factor and and factor this in into its uh, actions. But this is something that has to also be countered. And and you just. In, in, that's what you do in democracies. You debate and discuss and, and you disagree. Okay, moving on to China. Uh, one of the areas of some tension between the United States and Israel is Israel's relationship with China. Uh, where do you see that thing and what can be done to ameliorate the situation? Yeah, I mean, look, let me just say I'm not particularly knowledgeable about this topic. I've, I've, I've read some things and I've never done you know, kind of original research on my own on this. I've read other people's research. There's a very good study from the uh, INSS in Tel Aviv, the Institute for National Security Studies there. Um, I, I think, look, by and large, Israel's um, foreign trade with China is still very small. It's, it's compared to Europe and the United States, it's still you know, kind of uh, relatively small. Likewise, their, um, their relationship with you know, Chinese high-tech firms it, you know, pales into you know, when compared to um, you know, Europe and the United States, but I think the Israelis have sometimes um, not sufficiently, and I think this is more in the past, because I think they recognize now after you know, several US governments have emphasized the importance of the China factor them, I think they've kind of you know, um, readjusted their approach. But you know, early on, look, you know, early on the prospect of, of profit and, a very, and access to a very large market was very appealing to them. And I think they did some foolish things. And there's, you know, if you look at one of the Chinese, uh, the J-10 fighter, it looks like a lot, it looks very much like a LaVi. So there may have been tech transfer there, which I think was very foolish. I mean, it just, it's just stupid uh, on the Israelis part. Um, and, and, if, and, and if, God forbid, there's ever a conflict between the United States and China, you know, um, and Americans are, American fighters are shot, you know, American pilots are shot down by J-10s, you know, the Israelis will deservably, you know, um, uh, deserve criticism. But I think that's largely in the past. And I think they've been a lot more careful now. And I think they realize that there's no replacement to the United States and they have to be um, solicitous of American concerns and they have to be attentive to American concerns in this regard. So I, I think there's, you know, but the bottom line is, look, a lot of our allies, including in Europe, are not on board with us when it comes to 5G and stuff like that. So this is a challenge we face with a lot of our allies. 
Okay, Abuvi, you mentioned the Iron Dome and the challenges with the U.S. Now, recently, the Israelis have come up with this laser. Um, I wonder if you might talk about, and that's going to be a lot cheaper. The problem with the Iron Dome, of course, is very expensive to fire one of these against a very cheap Hamas missile. Now, do you think the laser system, assuming it works in clouds and in dust and everything else, which has been a question, do you think this is a, a future solution for the problem? Look, look, very often you don't get you don't get solutions, but you get, or at least the solutions are partial. Or, or look, even the Iron Dome, it's a, it's a ninety percent you know interception rate. So it's there's always going to be the possibility of leakage. So the same thing with with lasers, as you as you mentioned, you know there's there's a problem when it's you know when there's um, clouds and dust and the like. It it, it kind of breaks up the laser beam. Um, but in the end, you never know until the system is, is you know, fielded and, and used exactly how it's gonna perform. And there's always gonna be upgrades and tweaks. So the Israelis said that by the end of 2023, their goal is to field their first laser um, system, which will be used against small caliber kind of mortars and small rockets, um, because it won't have the power needed to affect a larger rocket. Um, but, the idea is, my understanding is that it's basically only a matter of scaling up the technology eventually. That, um, and that eventually, that within the decade, we'll have much more capable systems, you know, in the Israel and the United States that are fielded, that might be, could even deal with, you know, ballistic missiles and stuff like that. So this has the potential, and I wanna be careful, you know, carefully caveat this, it has the potential to be a game changer, okay? But again, you don't know until it actually happens. Likewise, you know, there's always going to be countermeasures and decoys and 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 things that are be done that that will be done to counter these kind of capabilities. Keep in mind, the Iron Dome has been only used against low tech um, rockets and and some missiles, um, and 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 missiles without countermeasures. Okay, so maybe a more sophisticated adversary would be able to suppress the effectiveness of a system like uh, Iron Dome. And maybe lasers, maybe there'll be countermeasures to lasers that will reduce their effectiveness. But really, as you said, um, you know, kind of cost per shot, per round, so to speak, of a, of a laser system, much cheaper um, than, than Iron Dome and, and other kind of uh, traditional missile defenses. So this has the potential to be a game changer. Okay, great. We'll have time for one last question. And that deals with Iran. Uh, let's assume that JCPOA goes through and suddenly has lots of billions of dollars for missiles and to aid Hezbollah and Hamas and Islamic Jihad. What do you think the reaction is going to be to this? You know, I don't know. I don't know because let me just say also, I don't think this part of the budget of the Iran's budget has been starved, okay? If you look at their official budget, what they declare, um, the ROGC actually, the, the Revolutionary Guard in Iran has benefited from increases in recent years, despite you know, the economic problems they've had. And, and, and Iran has been also sent, selling um, increased amounts of oil in the last, in the last um, year or so, or last um, eight months of the Trump administration, then you know, the first year of the Biden administration, their oil exports have been going up. So they, they, they've already been generating more income than they did Previously, under the um, uh, you know under the uh, sanctions before JCPOA, and then and then you know in the after maximum pressure, so I'm not sure. This since this part of the um, budget has not been starved anyhow, I'm not sure how much difference it's going to make. Um, and Iran already has done some you know has some very developed some very significant capabilities in this area. Clearly, it's always better to have more money for patronage when you're you know paying off militia members. You know, you, you could increase their salary. Maybe that you know they could help Hezbollah deal with the budgetary problems in Lebanon. You know, they could increase the, the, the amount of subventions to Hezbollah. Um, to, you know, to kind of slow the decline into fail, you know, state failure in Lebanon. So it, it, it'll probably help in some areas. But like I said, in terms of like hard military capabilities, I don't think this part of the budget has been starved. So I'm not I'm not sure how much difference it will it, it will make in, in the long run. In terms of Israel's response. You know, again, I think Israel will probably, you know, intensify its its efforts to counter um, Iran's activities if Iran, you know, ramps up its activities as well. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you very much. Let me turn it over to Emily for our last words.
So thank you very much, Michael. Um, and thank you, Bob, for uh, facilitating the Q&A um, for a really excellent uh, discussion. And I, I really appreciate the discussion of soft and hard power because I think the soft power aspects of the US-Israel partnership are not um, sufficiently appreciated. Uh, people tend to focus more on the hard power, but I'm going to uh, turn it over to Howard. Howard, if you'd like to say um, some final words. Sure, thank you. Th uh, thank you, Emily. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bob, for both. And, and uh, let, me, let me conclude with just, a, of course, a thank you to the Associated, um, without whom uh, none of this could happen. The uh, support from the Associated is critical to the work of the Baltimore Jewish Council um, and our community. And so if you haven't made your pledge yet for the campaign, I'll make a pitch to, uh, to, to make your pledge for 20, uh, for, for the year. Um, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you for a really thoughtful conversation. Keep your eyes out for more Israel programming. Let's hope uh, on some level, the, uh, we don't need to start doing another series of, uh, of programs on the dysfunctional Israeli government and what a new election would look like. We did enough of those when they went through the election 15 or 20 times uh, over the last couple of years. So hopefully we can, um, they can pull it together and we can uh, continue because um, I remember hearing, you know, hearing from friends at the embassy and all years without a budget makes it very hard to operate. A government makes it very hard to operate an embassy, makes it very hard to plan for the future. Um, and so uh, let's, hope, uh, let's hope we do it. And my concluding words is just a hug sameach to everyone. I hope you all have a, a wonderful Passover next week. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you, Michael.